Good morning. Welcome to the breakout session for the Sustainable Soybean Production Track. My name is Michael Gill. I am the uh, Director of Conservation Agriculture for the Illinois Soybean Association. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to mention that there will be one CEU in soil and water management available uh, for attending this breakout session. We will have the details at the end of the session offering the CEU on how to assess that credit. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with CCAs to offer this additional benefit. If at any point during the presentation, you have a question, please type it in the ask a question function in the sidebar on the left of your screen and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. Now let's hear a word from this session's sponsor, Compass Minerals. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kyle Lilly, Senior Product Manager and Soil Chemist for Compass Minerals Plant Nutrition. I'm excited to have a couple minutes to talk to you about season-long nutrition for your soybeans so you can help manage in-season stress and meet your crop's genetic potential. So this shows our Compass Crops Edge season-long nutritional system, giving your plants the nutrition needed to better tolerate issues like cold and wet soils and planting or mid-season uh, temperature variations or light stress. For soybeans, we recommend a pre-plant spring fertilizer that delivers zinc, manganese, and boron micronutrients like you'll find in three tracks, which is designed to coat each granule of a fertilizer blend to deliver even distribution across the field. We also recommend giving your soybeans a boost at planting with Rocket Seeds Molly Dry. This is a talcum graphite replacement that directly places your nutrients on the seed. Past two years, uh, we trialed this product across five states, including Illinois, and saw an average yield increase of more than 5%. For in-season, we recommend the unique combination of nickel, cobalt, and molybdenum found in ProAqua Pulse to help convert urea nitrogen within the plant into amino acids and proteins, ultimately boosting yield. Finally, we pull this all together uh, with HydroBullet Bloom, a product applied with your fungicide at flowering time to help with flower retention and converting flower into uh, pods to finish out the season. To learn about our complete season-long nutrition recommendations for soybeans, contact your local Compass Minerals representative. Thanks for your time this morning. Enjoy the Soybean Summit and here's to a successful 2021. Introduce today Dr. Andrew Marganut and Jeff O'Connor uh, presenting Soybean Nutrient Management for Profitability and Water Stewardship. Dr. Marganut is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. He completed his PhD at the University of California, Davis, evaluating soil fertility and phosphorus management. In 2017, he began at the University of Illinois where he is a research his research team evaluates nutrient management and soil health for profitability of crop production and nutrient loss reductions. Jeff O'Connor is a sixth generation farmer from Kankakee, Illinois, and is an at-large director for the Illinois Soybean Association. He holds a bachelor's degree in ag economics from the University of Illinois. He currently farms 800 acres of corn, soybeans, and wheat including non-GMO varieties for specialty markets. He's been a certified crop advisor for 20 years with a sustainability specialist certificate and has served on the Kangakee and water soil and water conservation board for 20 years. Jeff has been married for over 24 years and he has three children. He loves to hike in national parks, backpacking, making maple syrup and keeping bees. Now, please help me join in welcoming Andrew and Jeff. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. 
So, hi everyone. Thanks for making time to, to be here. We appreciate your uh, participation in this. And I mean that because there's a couple polls that Jeff and I have designed for a couple of reasons. One is we'd like to hear what your thoughts are on some of these topics when it comes to nutrients and spoiler, it's going to be largely phosphorus when it comes to these nutrients in soybean. And second is that um, we can better tailor some of our discussion based upon your own perception of some of these phosphorus options for soybean. So with that, we'd like to start this. Um, the title of the session is, well, it's actually cut off at the very top, but I think it says nutrient management for profitability in water stewardship in soybean. So as you'll see, we'll be talking about uh, a couple topics, but I'm gonna shift over to Jeff now. Um, a quick word on how Jeff and I uh, have come to be here together today. So this arose from, um, from an email that Jeff wrote to, to one of my grad students on a P option for crops. And we struck up a conversation for going on about a year now, right, Jeff? Yes. And so uh, to me, as a researcher, I'm thrilled that I can speak with a grower who's actually out there doing this stuff. Um, so to me, this epitomizes the best of what the land grant should be doing of researchers on campus interacting with farmers to understand what are questions that have impact in the real world. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say thank you as well for attending. It's nice to see that there's uh, at this time just over 100 people viewing this session. Uh, and we have to assume there's a good mix of farmers, um, advisors, crop consultants, and people in the supply industry. So we know we have a cross section out there. We will try to make it um, interesting for everybody and to be able to learn a little bit about um, both phosphorus and how it can affect water quality. Um, just to share a bit more and then we'll move is that yes, um, I'm in Kankakee County, northeast part of Illinois. Uh, we're not in an impaired watershed. We have a great water source here with the Kankakee River. We don't have a lot of the concerns that a good part of the state has or, or many areas in the state um, for excessive nutrients in water. Yet, I have always worked uh, to try and do better. And I believe we all, we all have that room to do a little better for producing crops, both economically, uh, best return on our investment with many of our decisions, but also to improve the environment. And yes, so our conversation came about both with the phosphorus and how we can use it uh, to better improve water quality. So I think uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna manage through the both of us handing off back and forth here. Uh, we have a good idea what we're doing, but Andrew, go ahead and let's go to the first slide there. So basically what we want to uh, accomplish here is um, soybeans uh, and the first one, uh, soybeans have not been around forever. Uh, so we're going to give you a, a, a quick overview of soybeans in the state. You know, how long have they been considered a cash crop um, and how was it viewed early on that we needed to fertilize this crop um, effectively and efficiently. Then we're going to go into specifically uh, the nutrient of phosphorus and how that has been accomplished historically, because I think that does, uh, in fact, I'm sure it, do, it does have a bearing in the cultural practices around phosphorus management in soybeans. And then we're gonna look at some different options that may be out there and what those implications with those fertilizers actually are for the water quality as it relates to soybeans. So th those are the three main points we're gonna work towards. And I'm sure as conversation goes on and questions pop up, um that we will expand on that a little bit so um i'm sure there's i'm going to assume there's no one here who uh, attending who was around for this 1924 um, release from the university of illinois uh first first real mention of soybeans uh, that andrew could find within the land grant system so it's 97 years old and it was only uh, suggested that its use was to be used for hor horses and mules uh, as a hay. Um, so as a grain, it just did not, it did not make the radar yet. And it does show, uh, as Andrew had highlighted there, that um, soybeans con contained more lime and, and phosphoric acid than corn. I did find it interesting as I looked through this chart on the, the table on the right hand side, if we go down to the very bottom where they're talking about the crude protein of soybeans, uh, it's at 33.2%. You, you know, that is still one of the focuses 
with the Illinois Soybean Board, how can we come up with varieties that are higher in protein for some of these more specialty markets? Really, we haven't changed much. Uh, you go back 97 years and the test at that time were showing 33% protein in there. Um, I did do a quick little note on the phosphoric acid, and phosphoric acid is P205. If you go back to this periodical, at that time they were saying to raise a bushel of soybeans. Now this table is pounds per hundredweight, but if you do the math, uh, one and two thirds bushels of soybeans, that works out to 0.82 pounds of phosphorus per bushel of soybeans removed. Today's current recommendations, which were updated in 2017 by Dr. Emerson Nafsinger, uh, the current recommendation is 0.71. Uh, it, the phosphorus that's removed in a bushel of soybeans is 0.71, so really not a lot of change in 97 years. Side note there is that that's remarkable given that the techniques they had to measure phosphate content were uh, I'll, I'll just say primitive to be kind. So it's amazing that these folks, you know, frankly, I think they were better scientists than us today. They had less fancy tools and they more or less got it right 100 years ago. So poll number one, I believe what you are all looking at is you have access to all three polls. Um, and this one says select all that apply. I will read through them to give you a little time and then we're gonna see what we come up with. So what P sources, have you used or heard of being used before? First one, I've used MAP and DAP, which is the monoammonium phosphate and diammonium phosphate. SSP and TSP, choice B, would be the uh, super single phosphate and triple superphosphate. C would be other dry blends, which also utilize some other micronutrients in there, more, much, much more recent development. And then we go into the historical side. Do you, do you remember your parents and grandparents using MAP, DAP? Do you ever remember, choice E, do you remember your parents and grandparents using the SSP, TSP? And lastly, where it all started, um, as far as commercially done was, do you remember parents or grandparents using phosphate rock? Andrew, whenever you're comfortable with the results that have come in and want to share, that is entirely up to you because I do not have that. Okay. So I just clicked on the results. Let me know, everyone, Jeff, if you see them popping up. Anything on your end? I do not at this time. Okay, then I will read out loud what the answers were. So right now we have only seven votes. Come on, folks. <laughs> We'd like to hear what you say or what you're thinking here. So there's seven votes that have come in. Okay, there's nine votes. Let's give it a few more seconds. It'd be nice to get 10, 20% of participants. So we have nine votes. Um, from those nine votes, I can tell you what we're finding. So uh, A has 44% of the votes. So I've used MAP or DAP. Oh, three votes just came in. We're at 12 votes now. So now one third, 33% of answers are I've used MAP or DAP. 25% I've used SSP or TSP. That's interesting. 16% is C. So I've used other dry P blends like MES Z. And then D, my parents or grandparents use MAP or DAP, is 8%. Uh, no one has answered about my parents or grandparents use SSP or TSP. However, 18% said that their parents or grandparents did use phosphate rock. So to summarize this, how I see these results is that uh, most folks that have uh, responded, they themselves are largely using ammonium phosphates, though some have experience with superphosphates. Uh, no one has really, well, um, in that their grandparents, from their memory, it seems like they've been using phosphate rock, but not always the superphosphate. So we see a generational difference here of the older producers, uh, or 
excuse me, back in the day, phosphate rock was the P option of choice. And today it's now a mix of, a, it seems like ammonium phosphates and superphosphates. But with the ammonium phosphates taking the lead as more people have used it. Yeah. Any comments, Jeff, on these poll results? Uh, no, not surprising. Um, not not surprising. I do not remember phosphate rock at all. And I had heard of triple superphosphate, remember being taught about it in high school ag classes, but had not used it myself until recently. Okay. Well, thank you all who voted on this poll. This sets us up nicely for the next few slides. So uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of background to help inform what we're about to see, which is the history of phosphorus options in general, but also for soybean in our state. So a bit of background here, all phosphate fertilizers are ultimately coming from phosphate rock. Phosphate rock is an ore. It's not that high in phosphorus. We're talking about on a good day, about 8% P2O5. Um, so obviously to get something like MAP or DAP, which are 46 to 52%, we have to concentrate the phosphorus from the raw material. This process is called acidulation. So as the name might imply, you acidify the phosphate rock, which is largely not phosphate, it's other things like calcium or silicates. You apply acid and the figure here kind of shows this where you've got different options like phosphoric acid, so you're adding a phosphate containing acid to further dissolve the phosphate rock. This thing gives you a highly enriched product like triple superphosphate. The triple, that refers to the number of washes that you typically do. Uh, single superphosphate is similar in nature in that we're acidifying, we're dissolving the non-phosphorous parts of the rock, of the ore. We discard those and we keep the phosphate. The difference between TSP and uh, SSP is a few things, but the critical piece is that there's one wash and you use sulfuric acid. So already here we see a difference is that SSP will contain a appreciable amount of sulfur because of the treatments with sulfuric acid. In contrast, TSP being made with phosphoric acid is lower on the sulfur. Now we today use largely in the US, and by largely I mean 88% of P that is bought and sold is in the form of ammonium phosphates. So today we use as a country largely the ammonium phosphates. These are also made from phosphate rock, same feedstock, again with phosphoric acid like TSP, except then it gets reacted with ammonia by Haber-Bosch, that's a gas. It'll then precipitate and it makes rather uh, this salt of ammonium phosphate. So I hope this is, um, somewhat helpful to understand that the family of phosphorus has one common ancestor and that is going to be phosphate rock that's the granddaddy of them all now back in the day people were just adding phosphate rock straight out of the mine as an amendment a key point here that we will get back to at the very end of today's session is that most of the phosphate rock in the world is coming from one place, or I'll phrase it a different way. Just like how most of the world's drillable oil is in the Arabian Peninsula, so too with phosphate rock, most of it comes from one part of the world. In this case, it's the northeast, sorry, the northwest part of Africa, what is today Morocco. We do have some mines in Florida, as well as in Idaho, Utah, these are relatively small compared to the global deposits, largely again from Morocco. Okay, so that detail will become important at the end of today. So this is an overview of these, what we're coining as different phases of phosphorus input. So this is not yet specific to soybean. This is just saying in general, what were the trends in our state? So a few things here. You're looking at um, on the x-axis going from left to right increasing time so we're, we're beginning uh, over 200 years ago in 1800 all the way to present day and on the y-axis looks like there was a, a jarbling of the units there but the label reads global p mining in terms of a uh, million metric tons per year so this is a global measurement of how much phosphate rock was being taken out of these deposits and entering the world as a fertilizer. So these are global trends, but because most of the phosphate rock is from one place, a global trend is just saying this is 
applicable to pea fertilizers, whether you're in Illinois or in Europe or in Africa. I think this is useful to help us think about how there had been a lot of changes in what we think of as the pea choice that we would go to first. So we have four phases. There's a pre-phase and then phase one, two, and three. We're going to dive into each of these one by one. This is to give you an overview. A couple caveats, of course, is that uh, these phases are Jeff and I, we ballpark them based upon some older uh, archival bulletins and papers from the U of I. Second, the phases are conceptual. So obviously there are times when there's substantial overlap. There were moments or decades where SSP and DAP were equally being sold and used. This is more to give you a sense of the dominant P source in a given decadal uh, range was X or Y. So the very first phase is, is what we might think of as the pre-fertilizer phase. And I want you to think about this because when it comes to lots of practices like tillage, we've been doing that since agriculture was a thing. Phosphorus inputs as a net input, so off farm, we're not recycling it as waste. Net inputs of phosphorus are relatively new within the past 70 years. So ag has been around for 10,000 years, but P inputs less than a century. So before that time, before we realized that we could tap into the phosphate rock deposits of the world, we were simply as a society recycling waste. And the main waste were bone meal and manure, both human and livestock. The bone meal for the Midwest is interesting because there were sources like slaughterhouses, but also bison. Part of the hunting of the bison was to harvest the bones. These were then ground up and sold as phosphate fertilizer. By the 1900s, though, we begin to realize, we as a society, that, hey, there's concentrated deposits of phosphate rock that have a little bit more phosphate content than bones. So why chase after bison and slaughterhouses when we can just mine a lot of this stuff? So herein, we entered into phase one. Now, note at the very bottom, we've got in blue different indicators or I'll say uh, mileposts for what was going on with soybeans in the US and in Illinois. So about the time that we shifted to phosphate rock mining and thus phosphate rock as a pea source, soybeans had a pretty good foothold in Illinois. So there's reports that by the 1920s that our state was already a leader in the production of soybean. As Jeff has pointed out, it was still being thought of as a hay, as forage for livestock, not quite as a grain yet. Uh, the first documented case of soybean hitting our shores as a country was in San Francisco in 1854. There were Japanese sailors that were stranded in San Francisco Bay and they traded soybean seeds with some American sailors. One of those sailors was from Illinois, and so he came back home here and brought the seeds with him. So kind of a cool story. So that is still in the pre-fertilizer phase. Once soybeans were, were um, established in our state, we began to enter the phosphate rock stage. Then we had the Green Revolution, massive breakthroughs in Haber-Bosch N becoming more available, and also the breeding of hybrids. And this is for all crops. That began to coincide with the uh, phase two, of phosphorus in general. So now we enter the phase of superphosphates. So now we're taking the phosphate rock, we're not using it directly, but rather we're acidulating it to concentrate it into a higher P content, either as SSP or as TSP. That then gave rise to phase three, and this delineation is a lot more amorphous than the previous ones. There was concurrent usage of superphosphates with ammonium phosphates around the 1960s to 70s. So now we find ourselves in phase three, where we're using wholeheartedly and mostly ammonium phosphates as MAP and DAP. So let's give some more details on what these three phases, one, two, and three, uh, look like. Uh, I'm showing you this graph as a preview of what you're about to see. We've taken data from USDA Economic Research Service, ERS, bottom right here. And we plotted data that is for the US, but also for Illinois in terms of the P type and the application rates specifically for soybean. So the way to interpret these graphs that you will see more of is on the X axis, we again have the year from left to right. A lot of this data didn't really start until 1960. So that's why we can only start there. Note how, for example, for map shown here in gray, there was no data being collected until about 1985. 
So that suggests that MAP was probably not as prominent, though we have a gap here. We don't really know what it was like pre-1985 in terms of usage. This is a nice example of how the delineation of phase two to phase three is amorphous. So to jog your memory from the previous slide, we have phase two, which is the superphosphates ending around the 1970s. That's about here. Uh, and so we see that the superphosphate in blue begins to be outstripped by the use of ammonium phosphates, specifically that of DAP. So this is the basis for how Jeff and I carved up the timeline into phase one, two, and three, these kinds of graphs. But be aware that there's obviously still superphosphate usage going on when there's greater DAP usage, but greater being a relative term. Okay, slide 10, there we go. So if we look at that first phase here, just in briefly in a little more detail, yeah, it, it highlights what those options were. Uh, of note to myself is that in 1908, you know, they were still shopping their different sources to find what was best. And much of it may have been uh, what they chose to use on their farms may have been um, a choice simply of availability, not unlike what we still uh, experience today with phosphorus sources. Um, as, as we go on in the presentation, uh, we will come across that, yeah, the availability of the, of the TSPs, the triple superphosphate availability is still a challenge today. We tend to go with as farmers, uh, producers, advisors with what is most available. But uh, going with the information back then, their main choices were obviously bone meal, steam bone meal, um, or the phosphate rock. Um, and when you really look at the practice uh, on the right-hand side, yeah, they may have only been applying 1,000 pounds per acre of the raw material once every year for five or six years. Nobody wants to do that today. And it would be, be very interesting to see some snapshots of how they had done that. Um, so yeah, just a historical perspective of what we had there. If anyone was uh, looking at an organic alternative, you do have the value of farm fresh manure at the very top. Uh, as well. So they did place a value on that. Okay, so then phase two is superphosphates. This is when we realized that we could acidulate, again, using acid to concentrate the P content. This has practical benefits, like as Jeff said, you don't have to add a couple thousand pounds per acre of phosphate rock, you can add 100 or 200 pounds of a concentrated version of that. So superphosphates, um, as the name implies, we have a higher P content. The main type was single superphosphate, and then later on triple superphosphate. So this is another example of some older bulletins. This is now 1928, we're looking at uh, 11 years after we saw that last uh, image that Jeff showed. And I just want to point out a few things. One is that they were pointing out that there's in superphosphate an appreciable amount of sulfur. And if you recall, this is because when we acidulate the raw feedstock, the phosphate rock, we can use sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid isn't, isn't fully taken out of the resulting product. As a result, there can be up to about 10% sulfur in superphosphates, especially in single superphosphate. So that was being noted as a benefit, as a free input that accompanies the phosphorus if you're using this as the phosphorus fertilizer. Um, they also note that part of the advantage of superphosphate is that it's more available. So phosphate rock is calcium phosphate, chemically speaking. It's the same stuff as what your teeth and bones are made out of. If you've ever left out chicken bones in the compost pile, you know it takes years for that bone to degrade. That's the same issue with phosphate rock. In our soils, unless you're really sitting at pH 4, very acidic, uh, you're not going to see dissolution. So part of the motivation to switch to superphosphate was it's less bulk to apply, but also it dissolves more readily. You don't have to wait eight years after applying 3,000 pounds per acre. As a side note, I thought it was uh, interesting how the price of peas is a lot higher per unit phosphorus today than back then. Makes sense. Uh, it used to be about five cents per pound of phosphorus. Okay, so now we enter into phase three. And on the right hand side, you can see that diagram that we had shown you of how to read it. On the left hand side, we have another bulletin clip. Now, 
Notice the date, we're moving up, now we're 1962. This is a report, it was part of a weekly bulletin put out by the U of I, just a quick communication, I guess the Twitter of the day. And what's interesting about this is that they make reference to a field trial that was testing and comparing different P sources. So I think this is interesting because if you look at the trends of the use of MAP, DAP, and superphosphate, we see that MAP and DAP weren't really being used on a national scale much compared to superphosphate before the 1970s. So this is 1962. We're about here on the curve. We're barely, as a country, using DAP, and MAP's not even on the map, so to speak. But this just goes to show that the land grant was already ahead of trying to, at the time, test these experimental P sources. So there was a moment where MAP and DAP were unknown for how well they would perform. And this is the early work in the 1960s of seeing how well can they substitute for superphosphate. Obviously, it worked out pretty well because we saw this decline quite rapidly in superphosphate as DAP and then MAP took over. And today, most of us are probably going to be using MAP and DAP. Okay, second poll that we have here. Uh, I'd love to have a few more participants this time. When and how do you primarily apply your phosphorus for soybean production? Um, first two are related to, in the first one, in the fall before corn, in a corn-soybean rotation, you broadcast it, so you're doing it once every other year. Number two, in the fall before the soybeans broadcast, or you're doing annual applications of uh, phosphorus. Three, in the spring, right before the soybean cat, uh, crop, and it's still being broadcast. D, uh, in the fall before the corn, uh, in that corn soybean rotation, but you're doing a deep placement. So you're either doing, you're probably doing strip tillage there. Uh, e, very similar, except it's before soybeans in a strip or deep placement. Or F, in the spring before the soybeans crop would use it in a strip or deep placement. Um, so if you would do, if you would kindly vote on that, we'll see what is trending out there for fertilizer applications. Yeah, and if I might interject here as far as where you can find those polls, if you click on agenda to the left of your screen, oh. that should pop up the sessions that you have registered for today. You may have to click on soybean nutrient management for profitability and water stewardship. That'll expose the polls. If you look on that page down below results and vote now, there are three little dots. The middle dot is the second poll. Thank you, Michael. While we're waiting for a few of those, I'd like to make the comment that one of the things that I think is a value in that timeline uh, that we showed before um, is that we don't change. We don't change our practices very frequently. In fact, we only change them a couple times in the history of soybean production here in the state based on what was available in the most current research. So we are already in the habit of not changing very often. What we hope to accomplish by the end of this presentation is can we challenge um, producers, advisors, consultants to rethink based on some newer information and if they, um, and new environmental concerns that we may have, is it time to look at changing some of our uh, phosphorus application methods and timing? While we're waiting as well, a little note here is that um, these are, this poll presents questions, uh, methods of how to use P for soybean that our lab, my lab at, at the U of I is gonna be testing with, with the support of the soybean board. So we're grateful for that support. What we're going to be doing beginning this spring is comparing at two sites down south by Ewing and then in central state at Urbana, of course, um, trying to update the agronomy handbook to account for the timing and the method of application. So we hope at the end of the next two years to have some results from these field trials funded by the soybean board to update the handbook, which right now is fairly agnostic to the timing and the placement for soybean. So we're hoping to see how much does it matter if it does matter in terms of yield uh, and then nutrient use efficiency, specifically phosphorus.
Okay, so we've got 31 votes, a lot better than last time. Thank you. Uh, I'll read them off again. So uh, the answer to A, 51% of participants are using MAP or DAP. 13% are using some kind of superphosphate. Um, I think I'm looking at the wrong poll here. Yeah. You got the wrong poll there. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So 36 votes on this one. It keeps coming up as the same poll. Um, from the tech support, any suggestions here? I keep clicking on results of poll two and it spits out first poll. How about we come back to that if we can get, a, get an answer sent back to us there? Yeah, we'll look into this. All right, thank you. Yep, thanks. Okay, well, TBD. Okay, so here's some more data from the ERS branch, the Economic Research Service of USDA. And this is instructive because it gives us a, it gives us a better sense of how the US in blue and then Illinois in orange um, have managed as an aggregate soybean phosphorus needs. So let's start with the left hand side. This is a graph showing from 1964 through uh, 2018 was the last data point, uh, the percent of soybean acres that get phosphorus. So this is saying phosphorus in front of soybeans specifically, not at the start of a corn soybean two year crop rotation. And what we see is that um, for quite some time, it's been relatively constant as Jeff has pointed out, less than 40% overall of soybean acres in Illinois and in the US have gotten P in front of the soybean. Then on the right hand side, we have um, the same comparisons of US in blue and Illinois in orange. And this is now asking, okay, for the same time points, what was the average rate of application? So these are aggregate data. They're based upon counties level sales of P and based upon the reports by the local districts. So it's kind of coarse, it's not farm level, but it's instructive because it shows a couple things. Uh, first thing is that Illinois tends to apply a little bit more phosphorus than the U.S. average. Makes sense. We have the highest yields in the country. We need more phosphorus to replenish the export, as Jeff said, per bushel of soybean grain. Second point is that the data are a little bit fluctuating, which I wonder whether that's how it was collected at the aggregate level. But it also might be reflecting uh, the wiseness of producers that are buying P when the prices are lower and not buying as much when the prices are higher. But note that the application rate is more variable than the amount of acres getting phosphorus. There's a key distinction there. Overall, the rate has gone up, and this makes sense because as we've uh, almost double yields in our state on average from 26 to 47 bushels per acre, well, you need a concurrent stepwise increase in the rate to replenish that. Okay, so now we're gonna to transition to the final theme of the, of the session, talking about the water quality implications of phosphorus choices, and specifically um, going back to the source of phosphorus being important for nitrogen. So that tends to be different of how we think of P, right? We think of ammonium phosphates for the P value. We sometimes get you know, free nitrogen. We'll talk about whether that's free. Um, but this is why we've been focused on phosphorus fertilization. So what we want to uh, make you think about here is that uh, considering how much uh, ammonium phosphate dominates the P choice in our state and in the country, if there's a fall application, whether it's in front of soy or at the beginning of a corn soybean phase, uh, there's a potential risk of losing the fall applied ammonium in the ammonium phosphate of the MAB or of the DAP. So almost paradoxically, how we manage phosphorus has implications for water quality via the nitrogen in the ammonium phosphate application. So here's the back of the envelope, uh, what we academics do best, we just armchair these big numbers. So just to give you a sense of what this could scale to, uh, if you assume that half of the acres that, that um, are going into soybean, it got a fall application of DAP, um, it comes out to there's quite a bit of nitrogen that's being co-applied with, sorry, quite a bit of nitrogen that's being co-applied as a P source. So if we assume DAP, which you know has a higher end content, to be fair, this scales to 
a fall application on half of our acres is 260 million pounds of nitrogen in the ammonium of the ammonium phosphate. So what is that magnitude? What does that mean? I know it's tough to make that tractable. So here's a way of thinking of it. Uh, the nutrient loss reduction strategy of Illinois, which is the plan to reduce nitrate losses to the Mississippi by X percent by 2025, uh, this has a target reduction of 170 million pounds. So the amount of N being fall applied as DAP in this example is more than half of what we need to reduce as a state collectively our nitrate loads to the Mississippi. So the long story short is that it's pretty appreciable. That little bit of N in the ammonium phosphate does add up over many scales on a statewide basis. I'm not saying that we're losing all of it. As we'll see in a second, the jury is out on whether it's available for the subsequent crop from a fall application. I'm just saying that it's a lot of nitrogen that we don't really think about because on a ton of MAP or DAP, it's not a whole lot. So as Andrew and I were preparing for this and he showed me that slide, I said, yeah, those are great big numbers, uh, but honestly, they're so big, it doesn't mean that much to me. I said, what about, what does this mean on a farm scale level? Let's break that down to, yeah, what about me and my farming operation? So we're gonna use the same numbers here for a quick example. 200 pound application of ammonium phosphate on a two year rotation. Now, actually, uh, that would be under applying uh, for phosphorus only if you had a 60 bushel corn crop and a 200 bushel or 60 bushel soybean and a 60 uh, 60 bushel soybean 200 bushel corn um, is going to need more than 200 pounds of ammonium phosphate if you're only looking at the phosphorus. For the sake of easy numbers, though, let's just use that 200 pounds per acre of ammonium phosphate. Now, your choice. Um, we know that MAP and DAP are going to be the most obvious sources of that phosphorus. Uh, the map on that 200 pound application, 22 pounds of N, you can see that DAP, 36 pounds of N. Now I know in my conversations uh, over my farming uh, career, you know, it's like, well, hey, that's free N, it may stick around, you know, we may get some credit for it. Um, and we oftentimes just dismiss it or laugh it off. We don't really know what happens to it. Um, how you individually plan, that's up to the landowner. But if you take those pounds of nitrogen that we're applying to a field, especially in the fall, uh, that adds up. 160 acre field, uh, quarter section. If you used a map, that's 3,500 pounds of pure nitrogen that was put on a field uh, that may not be there, or if it was for soybeans is not needed, you, you take the DAP numbers, you're getting close to uh, three tons. So huge numbers, um, huge numbers on a, on a farm scale. Um, if you want to look at it just as a soybean crop, you've got you've got the information in the lower box there. 50 bushel soybean crop, uh, recommended maintenance rates, three quarter of a pound per acre. That's 37 pounds of applied uh, as maintenance every year. If you provided that with MAP for each acre or DAP, you're going to be adding anywhere from eight to 14 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, now that that number is so small that we dismiss it as well. So I really think the take home on this is what you are doing in 160 acres um, is not much. Uh, you know, if you're an operation or advising people who have a couple thousand acres of soybeans, all you have to do are add, some, add a zero um, to those numbers we have up there for total that could potentially be a problem and not available to any crop. Okay, so I mentioned uh, two slides back that the jury is still out on what's the fate of fall applied ammonium phosphate, be it MAP or DAP. And Jeff and I, uh, we trolled the internet, not in that way, just trying to find uh, any potential sources, scientific studies or even not studies, just you know, some simple pairwise comparisons like strip trials on, hey, how much of that N from fall applied MAP or DAP is still there for the subsequent crop? be it corn or be it soybean. There's one study to our knowledge ever done. It was done here in Urbana at the U of I. And these are the data. So there's a lot here. I'm gonna walk you through it. Try not to read it because it can be confusing. So the way to interpret this is we've got two graphs, left and right. These are simply the two sites. So these are central and north states. We've got one at Urbana and at Waseca. 
I'm not familiar, Jeff. Is that being pronounced correctly, Paseca? I tend to have not seen it. Oh, okay. That makes me feel better then. So um, a couple caveats is that they're similar soil types. So we are missing the southern unglaciated region, things like the Sismi or the Ava. Uh, but that said, they're a good picture of central and north state. Um, and the soil types are overall then similar texture and organic matter wise. So that's the difference between left and right. Then the other thing to notice is that we've got different treatments over three years. So the three pairs in each graph are 04 through 06. This is done over three different years at two sites, so six site years. Then the next thing to, to look at is the y-axis and that green dotted line going out parallel. So that is saying that if you fully recover or retain the ammonium phosphates nitrogen, it will pop up at 100%. So to get all of it back, or rather if we find it in the soil when we come back in the spring before planting, it should be all there and it should be up against that dotted green line. That is 100% of what we added is still in the soil. So on that note, notice that we're not looking at plant recovery. This is not how much the crop took up. This is simply saying if we applied in the fall or in the springtime, and spring for them was, so I'll back up, fall for them was after harvest, October or November, and spring was as weather permitted, but it was a month before, in this case, corn planting. So whether or not you applied in the fall or the spring, how much did you recover in the soil? So in the top 12 inches of soil, how much ammonium or nitrate, which could be formed from the ammonium of the ammonium phosphate, how much is still there? So this is not saying that we're losing the difference. And the differences are shown in the red brackets. So these are the gaps. As an example, uh, if we look at Urbana in fall of 2004 versus the spring, when we came back, when we applied the map in the springtime in early April, then in May at planting, most, in fact, exactly all of the nitrogen was still in the top foot of soil makes sense if you apply in the spring right before you plant it should still stick around note that it's mostly as uh, nitrate in gray so we're adding ammonium phosphate what's happening is that it's wet it's warm so we're, the bacteria are nitrifying ammonium into the nitrate form so that's the second thing to notice is that we see a whole lot of gray across all these charts meaning that even with a spring application there's near immediate within a week transformation of the ammonium of the ammonium phosphate into nitrate. Okay, that's good to know. So for the spring application in Urbana, this example here, it's still in the top foot of soil. That's a good thing. It's going to be there for the crop. In the case of the same site, the same year, but now in the fall, we find that only about 30% is left in the top soil, in the top foot. Now we're not saying, in fact, the study does not show where it went. It could be at 13 inches, just under the 12th inch mark or it could have been flushed on the tile line, we just don't know. So we cannot infer losses, but we can think about the efficiency, the accessibility of the fall applied nitrate for that subsequent crop potentially being compromised. Again, this is, you're looking at folks, the best of the science right now, we don't really know too much. So the big takeaway here, first one is that regardless of when you're applying your ammonium phosphate, be it fall or spring, it's gonna nitrify. So you're gonna dissolve the granule, the ammonium zips off into the nitrate form pretty quickly. The second point is that when we're doing fall applications, up to 80% and on average about 66%, so two thirds on average, isn't recoverable, meaning it's not detectable in the surface foot of soil. Again, we don't know if it leached all the way out to the tile line or whether it's sitting at just beneath that 12 inch surface. So I think the bigger theme here is that timing does make a big difference for the free nitrogen that's in the ammonium phosphate. And as Jeff has pointed out at the farm scale or the field scale, it may not be a whole lot, uh, but in terms of water quality, eight or 10 pounds per acre of nitrate, if we were to lose all of it, and we probably aren't, but it might be a good chunk under some bad conditions like a wet spring, that can add up across the state to contribute to the Mississippi loads of nitrate. So, so what we have here is, we've spoken about that, um, that free nitrogen. And what we want to try and address here, what else may be coming in with that free nitrogen? 
uh, with our phosphates. And honestly, when, we're, when we begin to look at the tr more traditional, meaning in the last 40, 50 years sources, the MAP and DAP, that's really all you're getting is the phosphorus and the nitrogen. Very little sulfur uh, is in there and absolutely no calcium. One of the positives that comes out in the top part of that chart would be that these other alternative uh, sources of phosphorus, the older ones, uh, sources from some of the older phases of phosphorus used, the triple super, single super, uh, even a product called triple super phosphate sulfur, they do bring to us um, a little bit of sulfur, which we know um, is becoming more and more beneficial for soybeans, and it definitely brings some calcium to the mix, unquestionably. Not a huge amount, but can we attribute some kind of a value to that calcium for a crop, especially as uh, production levels get higher, and is the sulfur something that's desirable in the mix as well? Um, so there is an advantage uh, to not having nitrogen with your phosphorus, and let's rethink that free nitrogen uh, and instead think about the free sulfur and calcium. As a side note, if folks are wondering why for a MAP and DAP, there's zero to 1% sulfur, there's sometimes some residual sulfur from the processing, from the production of the fertilizer. So this is not that reliable. It can sometimes be nil, sometimes it is 1%. Okay, so we just showed a slide on the different P sources. Uh, as Jeff pointed out, we've got TSP, TSPS, which is a sulfur coating on the granule of the TSP granule. You get the added sulfur. It's also more slow release phosphorus is how the thinking goes. Uh, these are options that are relatively, from our experience, limited in Illinois. It's, it's hard to get your hands on TSP. I've got colleagues at the Ohio State up in Minnesota. They've also said that in their states, same deal. You, you got to plan ahead to be able to get a, a, a load of TSP. So we just want to point out that uh, this is a very active area of discussion. And there's some politics here, of course, on the sourcing of these different ores of phosphate rock or the P fertilizers that are then manufactured from those phosphate rock ores. And this, I think, is timely to bring up because uh, this past August into uh, September, the U.S. International Trade Commission uh, began a uh, investigation of the pricing of phosphate imports into the U.S. And uh, this is a, a petition by Mosaic, and it claimed, the link is here, that you can read that basically these offshore producers of phosphate rock remember that 95% of all the phosphate rock mines are in Morocco, that these, were, that these companies were flooding the U.S. market with cheap phosphate and thereby undermining uh, the phosphate rock industry and fertilizer industry in the U.S. Um, so this is just to point out that if you have interest in this, I think it's kind of a nice intersection of international trade and agriculture, uh, that there is a hearing scheduled, well, it was actually for yesterday, it looks like, on February 9th. This is an ongoing investigation by the U.S. International Trade Commission. There's big implications here for the sourcing. Um, if Morocco is able to access U.S. markets, then they can, they being the major producer of TSP, that would open up TSP probably as an option for U.S. growers. Anything to add, Jeff, from your perspective on this? Nope. So last poll here, and I think we're just going to talk through this. We're getting close on time and would love to get some questions. Um, I, I would just, these are going to be four of the main, main points that we find to be challenges for switching phosphorus sources. One, finding it. Uh, in my own experience, usually start talking in the middle of the summer to our suppliers to see who's going to have it. Uh, price, uh, price of the unit of phosphorus. Um, Historically, when you went, when Andrew and I dug back in some of that information, they would show pricing per year, and you could the the largest gap was to find triple superphosphate twenty percent less in price uh, than you would find DAP or MAP. Um, that has narrowed up now to where there's very little difference. So that's market fluctuation. Uh, there is some uncertainty. Is is it the exact same kind of uh, phosphorus source as our traditional DAPs and MAPs, which it is? And then handling, not so much on the producer end, but does it have different handling requirements with suppliers to have, first of all, an additional spot to stick it? Um, it, it and, and how does it store? So there are some other considerations there. If you'd like to fill out that poll so we can see those results, that'd be great. We're going to go to the last slide and then some questions. 
Looks like those results work, but we'll get back to them at the end in case we're tight on time. Yeah. Then the, the last point we have here is uh, how can we help and what needs to be done? Uh, in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, there was, through the NRCS, um, money allocated for conservation innovation, innovation grants. They also have a sector called OFT, on-farm trial. Really what this is, researchers at the land-grant universities do great research, but there always has to be a proof in the field that, that the concepts and theories that they've worked on in the lab um, will apply to the field. Last year, uh, Andrew uh, spent a lot of time putting together a grant, trying to get some specific money to come back to Illinois, working with partners to do research um, that would bring, involve local uh, statewide farmers in different regions. Uh, there's funding to the farmers um, for the time and effort, as well as providing material to do this, to find out what can we do to improve water quality uh, by switching uh, the phosphorus sources. There was also a component built in there, um, how will cover crops work in, in unison with these different sources to see what we can to do to maintain farm productivity, but to uh, improve the water quality. The funding on last year's was not granted. Uh, we will be reapplying for that uh, in, for the 2021 submission, hoping to get that. So we would be looking for participants to work with Andrew on that. Um, and yeah, any efforts to help support that are great. Looks like we have just a few minutes there, Andrew, for questions if we want to try and get a couple in. Sounds good. Um, so one note here, uh, there's my email. I'd be happy to talk with folks who have interest in being part of this proposal. It's going to be due in June, so we've got plenty of time to line up uh, sites. Uh, so first, before we go to questions, the results of the last poll of what would you identify as the key challenge to switching from MAP or DAP to TSP? So 44% uh, of respondents said that finding it is the main one. Now, 26% say it's the dollar per unit of phosphorus, and then 21% say it's actually the uncertainty of how it will perform. 9% say that they're not sure how to handle or how to apply it. So it seems like there's a pretty good distribution of, hmm, these might be obstacles to TSP. Okay, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. All right, at this point, we're gonna begin taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please type it in the ask the question uh, function on the sidebar at the left of your screen. We've had some pre-submitted questions, so we're gonna go through those first as other questions come in. And I might ask our presenters right up front here while we're bumping up against that time, do you gentlemen have time to stay a little longer to answer questions uh, if if we run over? Yes. A absolutely, it's snowing here, so I'm not going anywhere. Okay, and if we when we do bump up against that time frame where we're hitting 1120, we are going to display the QR code. So those of you that need to leave the presentation can actually get your credits submitted through that process. If you do not have the app for CCA credit uh, for CCA on your phone and you need to submit these in another manner, simply uh, take and um, I'm looking here, uh, go ahead and, and uh, email those to us by Friday and then we will submit those uh, by, uh, by bulk at that time. So with that, let's go to the questions. Uh, the first questions, and we've got some great questions today. So um, to the presenters, what are your thoughts on sulfur, potassium, phosphorus being, and phosphorus being applied with the planter? I'm assuming in a, in a two by two. I'll let you go, Andrew. <laughs> it's, it's a very broad question. Um, what, are, what are our thoughts on it sounds like combining all these things into one bundle. Yeah, I would take it either and also as an and or, um, you know, as you go through those different uh, products, I guess, so. Sure, well, this is part of why my group is doing field trials with the support of the soybean board is to get some answers down on, does it matter if you broadcast or do you do in furrow application of phosphorus and then as a starter or as a well before that crop is planted? application. Um, I think what, to me what strikes me from the research perspective, 
the benefit of in furrow is that you can get away with applying less because it's right in the root zone. And for a more shallow rooting crop like soybean compared to, to corn, that makes sense that you might be able to have the same yield supported with cutting back on the rate. Now, what interests me is then how do we do soil testing to account for that? Think about soil testing, it's all predicated on broadcast applications evenly across the field. So wherever you pull the soil samples to go out to the soil testing lab assumes that there is uniformity. Now, the lack of the uniformity by inferral placement presents an interesting question for soil scientists. How should we be sampling and interpreting those values to assess soil test phosphorus as well as for K? So those are my thoughts on that's an area of research. And I'm curious to hear more from, from folks by email how you've handled this on your fields. Okay, great. The next question, um, I have a couple questions that relate to um, adding nitrogen to soybeans. Uh, do you have any comment on that, uh, either of you? Uh, that is not something I've personally done. Uh, I have chosen to spend a little more time uh, applying some sulfur foliar and micronutrients foliar, uh, but genuinely, uh, with good soil test, you know, I'm not finding I'm not finding anything on my farm on my soils, you know, that are giving significant results. And definitely, uh, in, uh, replicating them. Who knows what the forecast is for the next year, both literally and figuratively, to know what will respond. But I think that approach of just having a a, a good base on your soil with good fertility um, is and and amending the soil that way. Uh, is going to give us the best returns long term. Um, I, I would love to see more on nitrogen. I know I don't want to create beans that are just very tall uh, and have lodging issues by adding that extra nitrogen. Andrew, any comment? Yeah, I think this is an area of active work is um, we know that high yielding soybeans, we're, we're talking upwards of 80 bushels. Um, they aren't able to fix all of their own nitrogen just on a mass balance. You do the math on how many pounds are coming off with the grain and what they could potentially fix through BNF, biological end fixation. Um, and it's less than what they're exporting with grain. And the evidence suggests that soybeans are very good at also accessing nitrogen that is mineralizing from organic matter naturally. Um, there's a lot of uh, studies on at what level yield. So we're talking like in the future 120 bushel soybean, there's going to be a point where maybe the plant's machinery can't keep up with the fixation needed to meet its end demands. But from what I understand from the evidence on the science side of things is that soybeans, as Jeff is saying, if you, if you give them the right system to fix their own nitrogen, they can do a pretty darn good job. I think there's a lot of... Um, a value in looking at if you see an end response to soybean, maybe it's that the conditions aren't right to let it fix its own. High levels of nitrate can disincentivize it from fixing. So there's been cases where people will apply a lot of nitrate as a pre-plant, it'll shut down that machinery and then yields end up becoming lower. So it's a pretty tricky issue of how to manage end for soybean from the research side. Okay. So the next question, another uh, uh, fertility question, and it, it really deals with micronutrients and, and it zeroes in on boron and molybdenum in the soybeans. Applications of those two individual uh, components or, or nutrients, um, especially since they are the two mobile forms of nutrients in the soil. Um, how, how, how is there any research or any insight you can give us on yield uh, with those two micronutrients? I've got theoretical answers. Jeff has probably a practical perspective on this. I could start with the theory. Um, so molybdenum is essential for end fixation. So it makes sense that for all legumes like soybean, but also common like soup beans, some soils, especially sandy soils, can be deficient in micronutrients just by virtue of having low CEC. So in those circumstances, applying a dash of MO makes sense. We're talking application rates that are so low, about a quarter, sometimes quarter ounce per acre, uh, or even one ounce, uh, that it's best done as a seed coating or as a foliar, as Jeff has, has mentioned. In our systems out here, we've got the natural inheritance and wealth of the post-glaciation period. We have plenty of micronutrients in general. Um, but again, I think your texture, if you're on sand, 
then it might be economic to apply these. That, that's a good. Uh, that's a good lead into my comment. Uh, one of the things I do with both soybeans and the wheat that I do raise is uh, I like to in the spring go out and take a very early soil sample and mark those areas specifically. Uh, and I'll use the old fashioned uh, flag so I can go back very close. To, so what I'll do, I'll do some soil samples spring. I will go back as the crop starts to grow and take some tissue test um, and to help me identify, first of all, what I'm seeing in the soil, is it manifesting uh, itself in the plant tissue as well. And there's actually some very some very big differences in what the soil will say. Um, ma magnesium is one of them. Even though I have soil that is is reading high in magnesium, I can have tissue tests that say they're low. Now keep in mind where I'm doing most of this work is sandier ground, uh, sandy loam, um, not, you know, so you're gonna have differences, but I don't find a correlation between what the soil might say um, and what the tissue test will say in that exact spot. Um, now, if you want to ask, what do I do? For some of the low uh, costs that you can put into foliar application, you know, with micronutrients on wheat and soybeans, I still do it anyway. And I think in the environment with uh, the prospects of higher, uh, some higher incomes this year with crop prices, I'm sure not going to cut it out of there. Um, I'm still doing, I'm still doing those, those tests. You know, I've not given up on it, but I'm all, because I want to know more but there's not much correlation yet i still do the practice okay very good so uh the next question is um quite broad again um so I, I'll, I'll let you guys take this one but um so it says what are some of the ways to increase nutrient uptake and availability for the soybean crop so it talks about fertility banding which we we've, we've discussed already but it also goes into soil microbes or biologics and then it all talks also talks about uh, root growth promoters. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump on that one first because I am an advocate for cover crops. I've been working with it. I'm losing track. It hasn't been 10 years. I uh, have now gotten into more diverse mixes. I love using cover crops, especially in front of soybeans, not only for some weed control, uh, but what it does for the soil. Um, and I have found my... Uh, when I, if I could chart out when my soybean yields have started to uh, incrementally get larger from year to year, it's been in that last 10 years where I've been using the cover crops. Just, you know, keeping the traffic off the field, um, I'm broadcasting my cover crop seed, allowing that system to, to aerate the soil to an increase the amount of mycorrhizal fungi. I think that's, it, it works so well and is so adaptable in front of soybeans. Um, I, I think it's a great way to just boost that soil profile haven't begun to even look at what we may have for some small opportunities for water quality credits or carbon credits. That's a whole different topic. Um, but I think we're really on to something there on what that can do. And that's why this research um, that Dr. Margonot uh, was writing a grant for is also including some cover crops. What can we learn by, you know, stacking a couple uh, variables in there? Anything to add, Andrew? Uh, not too much. I'll note that the realm of biostimulants, which is a, a category that's not so well defined, these are non-hormone uh, products that through non-hormonal or non-nutrient means increase yield. That market is uh, emerging. I'm sure folks have seen a whole lot of uh, products out there. A lot of work being done to understand how effective they are. Um, I think using biology more is one of the areas where ag can improve on yields and on uh, sustainability. And that to me, by the way, is the parallel movement on soil health. That's all about the biology. So I think there's a lot of integration here of products that foment more biology to support more sustainable yields and higher yields, importantly. Very good, very good. Yes, okay, so um, let me see what else we have for questions. Um, does tillage consistently pay for itself, time, labor, fuel with higher yields? So I think the question there is, is, you know, you get into, you know, you have the, the gradient of, of minimum till to, to no till, um, you know, strip till maybe being in there someplace, um, you know, that's where that question I think is directed, so. That's a hard one to answer, Michael, because um, 
there's so many variables and I've already stated, you know, I'm moving on to the other side where less is more. Um, and I just like to not travel across that field unless I have to. Um, but you can find some, you know, if I address, when I look at these carbon markets, uh, you know, the what if years that people are not addressing yet, there are those what if years where maybe you have to do some repair to a field um, or, you know, we, we had a fall where we created ruts and we need to, to level out the playing field, so to speak. Uh, you know, even myself, I can find reasons why tillage may be needed. Um, that's not where my focus is on and not where I've seen my greatest results. Um, so yeah, I, think it's, I think it's a very individual case and I don't know what research would say long-term on that. Really, the long-term has been that we have done tillage. The long-term study has not been if we cut out tillage or reduce it greatly. Yeah, Andrew, anything additional? Yeah, to, to echo Jeff, I think really it depends. The joke is that that's the sole scientist's favorite answer. It depends. But I think there's conditions where no tillage will never make sense and places where it makes the most sense. And that will scale by time, too. Uh, there might be lags of one year to 10 years to see the benefits then overshoot the initial cost. OK, great. So this question uh, is uh, directed toward the uh, data collection side of, of agriculture, precision farming. So how important is data and recorded history of every pass on every field for qualification? I guess I'd, I'd want to know what the quali quali qualification for what specifically. Um, you know, I think if I look at the, if I look at uh, kind of the farming landscape right now, where do I hear the word qualification and wanting to record everything data wise most frequently um, is relating to these emerging, emerging ecosystem markets to where they really want to have access and, and record of everything that's going on. That's where I hear of qualification most. Don't know what this question was specifically um, directed towards. Um, but we're surely not going to get go to a system um, where there's less data being recorded and kept. Okay. As Jeff has pointed out, these markets seems like uh, they might be coming as voluntary uh, in the first stages. Uh, I think there's a lot of uncertainties on what those markets will look like and for what end. But I think we're hearing a lot about carbon credit markets coming. Um, so those, in order to verify that there's a, a supposed credit, um, there's a lot of record keeping involved. Um, I think a lot of things to be decided on how that would look like if it goes forward. Michael, if you look at the water quality credits have not been spoken about very much, uh, but they're very much a player in the ecosystem markets. If I look at what this presentation and water qual excuse me, and what water quality would do, um, is that one of those components that will be necessary is, um, are you applying any nitrogen along with phosphorus? Um, very clearly, if you can clear some nitrogen out of your system that's not needed, um, it's only gonna make that water quality market more attractive. You know, it, it may be even paramount to even be able to enroll into it, but the water quality side has not been uh, discussed as much and we're gonna continue to hear more. Okay. All right, just that we'll, uh, we've got a lot more questions here, but uh, uh, with respects to your gentleman's time, uh, we're, we're gonna take uh, randomly a couple more of these. Okay. Um, is any P lost in any P application? So I and think we'll look, this yeah. is really at, at, you know, how it's applied, obviously. So would you repeat the would you re repeat the question again? Then? So it says, is any P phosphorus lost in any phosphorus application? There's a way to lose any nutrient uh, under any circumstance. Um, we we and I can find ways to lose something that I never thought was possible. Um, generally, though, phosphorus, um, you know, first of all, NREC does a lot of great work on that. There's a lot of great information out there. Uh, very simply, phosphorus is most often lost through soil um, leaving the field, you know, so actual erosion. So that's going to be an opportunity. We're sitting here in the middle of winter. Um, we've gotten a lot better at not applying phosphorus. 
um, in the winter time on frozen ground because it just doesn't work. Um, it, there's just way too much risk there. We have gotten a lot better collectively. Um, through water, I believe, and I'm gonna let Andrew fill in these blanks here, I believe there's starting to be some information that there are small amounts of phosphorus that can move through the water. Andrew? Yes, um, so to your first two points, Jeff, uh, on the whole, it seems like most phosphorus losses off farm are erosion, which to me is important for two reasons. One, um, there needs to be more acknowledgement that there's not over application of phosphorus in many cases when there's phosphorus losses. That's unfair. And the data suggests that in our state, we're at balance. We're putting on what we're taking off. So RP losses are not an issue of over application. Second is that because it's erosion, then we can double dip any conservation practices to also draw down on off-field peat losses. So it's good for your soil in terms of conservation. Things like cover crops or terraces will also have benefits for reducing peat losses. Um, Jeff's point here about tile drainage, which in the central north part of the state is uh, proportionally more important than runoff because it's flatter ground. There's evidence that tile drain can be a conduit for losing phosphate, um, but the magnitude is pretty small. We're, we're talking, there's limited studies, but we're talking under a pound per acre of pea through the tile drain. So it's, you know, small that adds up over all those acres, but it's not a major loss pathway. A big determinant of this is preferential flow. So if you get, if you got shrink swallow clays on your field and they crack in the summer, that's a actual, you know, uh, well, if that's a, a highway to the tile drain, that seems to be the way through which phosphate on the surface can work its way down. This is the big issue in the northwest part of Ohio. They have a lot of losses in their heavy clay soils, even after adopting no-till, because with no-tillage, earthworms made holes to go down to the tile drain, and so pea got leached to the tile drain. So it goes to show, again, it depends, and uh, context matters quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question. So uh, it's actually two questions in one. Um, when is the optimal time to do tissue testing? And uh, will they actually tell you what nutrients need to be added? I could start, Jeff. That sounds good. I, I, I can say what I try to do. And all of us involved in agriculture know knows that there's a there's this is kind of a crapshoot um i know ideally that my game book says i want to do my foliar application uh, of a fungicide or of a last post if we're talking soybeans and we should be um i'm working backwards this under a normal year would be my last opportunity to do it i want to take my sampling at a time frame uh, early enough in front of that that the information is relevant time-wise, but still allows me a small window to be able to apply that. Um, you know, based on the acres you have to get over to applying those micronutrients, you're gonna have to figure out when you need to have that done. Um, do I think in any way testing the 1st of June for a July 1st application uh, is the right way to do it? No, I, do, I think we can do better, but we also know the, uh, the game book changes based on what the opponent's doing to us as well. Um, that's just how I, I manage it. Um, there's going to be a lot of other successful approaches, successful approaches to that besides the one I mentioned. To add to that, I think foliar tests when and how you do it, um, I think it really, I think of foliar as, as, a, as a snapshot, right? And the problem in the, it's a double-edged sword, they're great because they're snapshots, but they're snapshots. If you go out the next day, if you go after a rainstorm, you can get very different nutrient concentrations, even on the same plant is what we've seen here. Now, I think foliars are really good when they're paired with soil, and here's why. Sometimes soil, especially for micros, mellic extractable copper zinc, there's a pretty poor correlation with uptake of those micros by the plant. And so for your systems, you can develop your own, maybe not correlations, but categorizations of low, medium, high by comparing foliar tests with your soil tests. To me, it's the coupling of both of them that's very powerful. There's a lot of work to be done on that. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, both for today. Um, all right, folks, that's all the time we have today for the breakout session. So we are going to stop taking questions at this time. I'd like to remind you 
uh, the audience that if you are a CCA, don't forget to claim your one CEU. You can either scan the code that we've had on the screen for some time now or using the CCA uh, uh, a app or email our team uh, your CCA number uh, by Friday uh, to be submitted for the credit. So with that, um, I'll end the presentation today and uh, thanks for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.